Welcome back, everyone. This is Brian with Faith on Fire, and I have a challenge for you today, one that I think will be very interesting to you as I tell you two stories and how you react and believe one or not believe one or the other is really going to be very revealing to yourself. This is going to be an introspective look at where you are with your faith. Now, let's face facts. There are some very big name ministers or preachers out there and pastors who have influenced a ton of people to believe in a concept called cessationism. John MacArthur, Justin Peters are just two. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about them in this video a little later. But for now, they have led a lot of people to believe that, yes, God is a God of miracles, but certain gifts of the Holy Spirit have ceased. Therefore, we're not going to see miracles in the area of healing in particular. I know there's others speaking in tongues, word of prophecy and things like that. They don't believe in either. But this video is going to be more about miraculous healing. And so I'm going to tell you two stories. The first one actually has more witnesses to it and is more recent and writings about it than the second story has. And yet, because the second story is in the Bible, as rare as it is and as few witnesses to it as there are, I bet you have no problem as a Bible believer, which I hope you are, believing the second story. And the question and introspectively you're going to look at, and I think this is where the edification will come from, being a bit of a critical thinker and with the concepts I'm going to go into in this video, I think you'll be challenged to wonder why some of you don't believe the first story or any story like it today, but you believe the second story in the Bible, and rightfully so you should. So I think this is going to be interesting. I hope you'll listen to this video, listen to the stories, and be challenged uh, in, in the area of your faith and your view of God and when it comes to miracles. So let's get into the story. Here it is. First of all, let me ask you if you've heard of the Azusa Street Miracle, or there's miracles actually, um, Azusa Street Revival. Now, I'm not going to go into the history or the details or what movement has sparked or that. That's all important as part of the history of the Azusa Street Revival, but it's not import, important to the question today. But let me just tell you that, you know, a little over 100 years ago, early, early 1900s, there was a building on Azusa Street that this church, an individual, rented out for church services. And they began a church service that pretty much went straight without ever stopping for three and a half years. And miracles took place. And many people came to faith in Christ. And it was something else. Now, regardless if you know about that or not, let me. this is the point I want you to focus on. One such story that came out of that even though there was more than one, was a miraculous healing of a man who had been in a railroad accident and he had his leg amputated above the knee uh, at the thigh. And he had a wooden leg. And he had started to get uh, gangrene where the, where, the, where the wood you know, touched the skin of where it was amputated. And so doctors told him he'd have to have it amputated even further up. Uh, so as unpleasant as all that sounds, he went there and he was asking to be prayed for and healed. And he was healed and miraculously before the people that were present, his leg completely grew back from nothing. And so this is often a, a circumstance where people would say, well, if if the gift of healing is still in operation today, show me someone who has had a, show me an amputee who's had a, a limb grow back miraculously. Well, this is important to the second story. So do you believe such a story is true? Or do you believe it's completely made up or was fraudulent or whatever? That's what I'm curious. And I'm not going to tell you really what to think about it. I'm just telling you this is the story. This is what's been documented by people who were there it's been written and repeated this story over over the years about this miraculous amputee having his leg grow back do you believe that is possible now there are two ways that cessationists which are the ones who believe that certain gifts of the holy spirit which would include the gift of healing have ceased with the apostles back in the bible that they would take this approach number one most cessationists claim they do believe in miracles and that God does still do miracles. They just don't believe anyone operates within the gifts of miracles or of tongues or of prophecy or word of knowledge or of the gift of healing. 
So you see, these gifts have ceased. Now, I'm telling you right now, the major mistake they make is that they attribute these miracles to an individual that has the gift. But that's not the way the Bible worked. That's not the way it is. If we were to say that Paul healed someone or Peter healed someone, that is... That's okay to speak in that way, but let's let's remind ourselves that it's not Peter or Paul or any of the other apostles that had the power. The power is with God. They were just obedient, willing vessels whom through God did miraculous things because they had a gift of healing. So if they had a gift of healing, it wasn't that Paul who suddenly was lifted up to be equal with God, that he could on demand choose in his own free will, here's who I want to heal. Boom, be healed in my name. I'm Paul. I have a gift of healing. No, I, I think cessationists often portray the gift of healing to be like that. And that's how they get to discredit it. It's a straw man argument. It's the, it's the argument that says, hey, show me a miracle and I'll believe the gift of healing is still in operation today. But since I don't see medical evidence of that, I don't see proof of that, I'm not going to believe it's an evidence. I don't believe it's happening today. And really, unfortunately, what, they're, what they are really doing is they're actually contradicting the earlier statement that they believe God still does miracles. Because if they believe God still did miracles in reality, if they had faith for that, then they would have the faith that God works through people as being the hands and feet of Jesus. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit, as many as there are, there's none that the Bible says cease. There's none that the Bible even suggests cease. As a matter of fact, the Bible does quite the opposite to suggest that these things would be evident by the followers of Christ uh, without ceasing. And so, so back to the, 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 the rhetorical question, the Azusa Street miracle. I don't know if it was true or not, but I can make a choice whether or not I would believe such a thing is true. Could someone lay hands on someone and have uh, uh, an amputated leg or a limb or something grow back. And I 100% believe that is true. Do I expect to see that personally in front of my face in my lifetime? I'm open to it, but no, I'm not counting on it. And so here's the thing. I want to go to the next story. Some people have very strong feelings about this, and they are influenced by the leading voices. Who are the leading voices of cessationists today? I mean, we got obviously the big name ones, right? We got John MacArthur, who's greatly admired for whatever reason, 50 years of ministry, teaching Calvinism and cessationism. I wouldn't find that to be anything to admire. But anyway, Justin Peters, he's another another big name I've talked about. And so those are two people. There's so many more, but I don't follow all the others out there. I don't waste my time on Calvinist discernment channels watching them. So, I mean, Justin Peters is pretty much the limit. I mean, I, I don't have the stomach to watch the others. When it comes down to it, sometimes people ask me, well, why do you always talk about John MacArthur and Justin Peters more than anyone else? And it's because I don't have the stomach to watch the other Calvinists. I just don't, right? So I limit it. And those happen to be two people that over the years, even John MacArthur, much longer, of course, than Justin Peters, that I have listened to in the car, the radio, in the car, commute, or or have watched on YouTube even um, in more recent years, in the last decade. And so, so I have just more first-hand knowledge of what they taught and what they preached and have been able to evaluate over a period of time, which is why I kind of go back to them. Um, they are kind of like the poster child, if it were, in my mind, to Calvinism and cessationism. I mean, I know John Piper and, and Stephen Lawson and Vody Bauckham and some other names like this are well-known. They're big names. Um, Paul Washer is another big name. But these are not people, maybe John Piper a little bit, but th these others are, are people that I have zero interest in watching just so I can come on here and report something about them, about what they talked about predestination and election and, and, and misinterpreted the Bible's doctrine on predestination and election. And, and, and instead they adopt this Calvinistic religious system that's totally false. Yeah, I'm not interested in doing that. It only takes one example of a leading voice of Calvinism to be the poster child that is the example I go by. And so that's why I talk about some of this, these same people, uh, John MacArthur and Justin Peters, kind of over and over again. And so, um, and uh, I don't think John MacArthur is even aware of me, but Justin Peters is. And I know it bothers him that I use him on videos and so forth because he's expressed that to me. And well, guess what? That's too bad. You know, I, I pray for him that uh, John MacArthur, for that matter, that they will one day wake up and that they'll get right with God. 
and they will renounce Calvinism and cessationism because they've operated in a way that influences many people to um, shipwreck their faith. It's very dangerous. So with that being said, let me go to the second story. Now, my question is the same. Do you believe the story? In Acts chapter 20, okay, the Apostle Paul is preaching, and he's going a little long. It's what the Bible tells us, right? And someone named Eutychus falls asleep in a window, three stories up, he falls out the window, splat, he's dead, okay? So Paul goes down there, embraces him, prays for him, and he comes back to life. He is resurrected from the dead. And that is one account in the Bible, the one and only account of Paul healing someone, supposedly, in such a way that he actually rose from the dead. Now, my question is, do you believe that story? Do you believe that actually happened? And I want to give you some similarities. The Azusa Street miracle happened at a time that no one alive today, as old as you might be, was still not alive then. You weren't born yet because it's well over 100 years ago, 120 years ago or something like that ago, almost. So all we can do is listen to the stories. None of us have a firsthand witness account of it. There's no video of it. I don't. I, I didn't do enough research to see if there's pictures or anything like that. But I mean, I, this is people passing down a story. And so the question is, if that is true, and we believe it, not because we witnessed it, but we believe it by faith, because the Bible says that this is what happens, that this is a miracle of God through people who have a gift of healing. Well, so that means people are making a position that they believe the Bible, they believe the Bible by faith. They even believe in their salvation by faith to some extent. I believe God has a way of confirming in believers that they have placed their faith and trust in Christ. And it's been well placed accurately and correctly. I've, I believe that God has a way at some point individually of letting us know we're truly in relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and our faith is well placed. But that aside, we come to faith in Jesus Christ by faith. We were not there 2,000 years ago to witness his death, burial, and resurrection. Right. So the fact of the matter is we must believe by faith that the word of God is true. So oh, I don't have it here. I took it in the other room, so I was going to grab my Bible. <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, here's the thing. If we believe the word of God is true and we believe it by faith, why do we fail to believe similar things that happen after that could not also be true. Why, why do some people say, I won't believe it unless you give me proof? Why is it that you can have faith that Jesus died on the cross for you, was buried and rose from the dead? You did not witness that. No one's giving you a medical report about it. How is it that you could believe on that just because it's in the Bible? I mean, a, a, a critic would say, hey, the Bible is just written by a bunch of different men. Us Bible believers say, no, 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 this is the word of God. These men were inspired by God. The Holy Spirit moved in them to, uh, to write this. And this is, this is Holy Scripture. There's no doubting it. Even if, I, I would say, even if a person doubts any of it, that there's an issue. I mean, there's a problem. You know, like who, if you doubt, uh, say, the creation story, and you instead go with evolution, I'd say that's, that's, that's evidence that there's a bigger issue with your not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ to begin with, because if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the deity of Christ, and you know that he is God, then you know that he inspired the whole word of God and all of it can be trusted. I, I, that's just my view. Scripture is the sole authority in a Bible believer's life. I mean, that's why we call ourselves Bible believers. <laughs> we believe it, <laughs> all of it. Well, anyway, that being said, uh, I think it's very interesting to me that there are some people who seem to have this, um, they want everything to be intellectual and proven. It's like these are the same people who are susceptible to believing in evolution and that nature basically is God. I mean, I, I hope you know that. Evolutionists, um, they, they have a religion. Their religion has a God. That God is nature. They worship nature and they believe nature created itself out of nowhere instead of God creating everything out of nowhere, out of nothing. It's just a false god that's all it is it's a religion right and and the fact is none of it can be proven in a laboratory none of it is is scientifically sound so calling evolution science doesn't mean it's science it's not science it's a religion and so 
Therefore, when we read the Bible and by faith we believe that certain miracles happened, why is it that people cannot believe that today? I just don't get it. I just don't understand why someone would not believe. Now, so you say, okay, I know why, because there's frauds out there. Wait a second. This should not be difficult for us to figure out who the frauds are. It's very simple. None of the people who did miracles in the name of Jesus in the Bible asked for money in exchange for the miracle. And matter of fact, there was one account, Simon the sorcerer, who was so enamored by the work of the Holy Spirit that he witnessed that he wanted that power and he was willing to pay Peter for the power. Hey, I'll pay you. Give me that power of the Holy Spirit you're talking about there. And Peter rebuked him. He didn't understand it. Didn't It, it doesn't work that way. You can't buy it. <laughs> right? And so we, we see that there are people trying to sell miracles. Now, that ought to be your first clue for those who say, sow a seed into a ministry and your miracle's coming. Every one of them is a fraud because they are not emulating or modeling themselves after what we clearly see the apostles doing in scripture and in the early church. So there, but if you respond to, I'll give you a case in point. Let's say you two people have a $20 bill. One of them is real and one of them is counterfeit. Is the counterfeit $20 bill worth anything? Answer, no, it's worth zero. Can some people be fooled by the counterfeit and take it and receive it and say, here, I'll give you this thing, whatever it is, you know, I'll give you this product that I have to sell. It costs 20 bucks. Ooh, I take that. And you receive a $20 counterfeit bill. Well, what happens if you take that $20 counterfeit bill to the bank, which really knows better? And you say, I'd like to deposit into the bank account for me here. They're going to look at it, study it, and they're going to know immediately because they know the genuine $20 bill, which is worth $20 bills, and this has got something in it that clearly is different, and they go, mm, this is counterfeit. You're going to find out you got ripped off. So there are people being ripped off all the time with counterfeit ministries, counterfeit miracles, and counterfeit... But does that mean like a $20 counterfeit suddenly makes every real legitimate $20 bill no longer worth anything? No, it doesn't change that at all. But what it should encourage us to do is to become experts, so to speak, in what is legitimate, genuine faith and miracles. The things of God, the things that the Holy Spirit is doing in this world. As Bible-believing, born-again Christians, we should be attuned to this. We should have spiritual discernment given to us by the Holy Spirit that we're attuned to, to recognize and discern these so it should not be difficult to discern the counterfeits, although some of them are really slick. I mean, after all, they're, they're called wolves in sheep's clothing for a reason. I mean, after all, they look like a sheep, act like a sheep, they talk like a sheep, but they're wolves. And it, we need to exercise discernment, which comes through being on a daily basis, I firmly believe, in the Word of God, to pray, ask God for discernment, and to also pray and ask God, like the one person uh, told Jesus, and I'll read it actually, it's from Mark chapter 9, and there's a man who brings his son who's got an evil spirit, and he brings him to Jesus, and in verse 23 and 24, it goes like this, Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out, and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. So in other words, this man is telling Jesus, yes, I believe, but really not. Help me with my unbelief. We need to pray that prayer. We need to pray to God. Help us in our areas of unbelief where you would want me to have faith and believe. That's a simple prayer you can ask God for every day. Help me, Lord, to discern the frauds from the real thing. And help me, Lord, to not be a spokesperson against the work of the Holy Spirit. Let me not be one of these people that go out there and always question every single thing. Because some of it might be fraudulent, but some of it might be the real deal. And I don't want to be speaking out against the real deal. I don't want to be speaking out and causing doubt and hurting other people's faith in the real legitimate move of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit in this world, right? Uh, that, so this is the message I wanted to get across today. Um, God is not dead. 
The Holy Spirit is still active in the world in many ways. But let me ask you this final question. Back again. How many people did Paul, it was God, obviously, but did Paul raise from the dead by this miraculous work through him that God did? How many times did it happen? One time. Now, how many people that lived at that time, roughly 2,000 years ago, witnessed it? Probably like 99.99999, I go out many, many, 99.99% of the entire population of the world at the time did not actually witness it. So few people actually witnessed it. But then how many people from that story going out about what the Apostle Paul did, how many people by faith, believed it was true that, yes, this is something God did do. Now, 2,000 years later, if you're a person who believes the story in Acts chapter 20, (laughs) that Paul literally was there, embraced this man, prayed for him, and he rose from the dead, then congratulations, you're a person of faith who believes in the miracle power of God, even though you did not witness it firsthand. So maybe you should be more open to the idea that miracles still happen today. And there are obedient vessels, people, the hands and feet of Jesus, who are stepping out in faith, laying hands on people, praying for people, like Paul, embracing people, whatever, and trusting God to do the miracle. And sometimes, and it may be few and far between, it is true that God wants to do the miracle and he's going to do it through a willing, obedient vessel at that particular moment. And we should live in the expectancy that God God is a healer, and he's still a healer. And like I said, there was one person that came back from the dead with Paul in the story at all. Did Paul not have the anointing of the gift of the of miracles and the gift of healing? He absolutely did. How come he did not go after every martyr, every friend of his, every Christian, and say, I'm on demand. I'm going to do it again. Hey, you're going to come back from the dead. You're going to come back from dead. And you're going to come back from the dead. And I'm going to go and I'm going to miraculously get all these people being persecuted by the uh, the Romans or Nero, whomever. And I'm going to, which Paul himself was, by the way, put to death by Nero, right? Beheaded for his faith. Right? The point is that we do not determine who's going to get healed, and when they were going to get healed, or why they're getting healed. That's one of the mysteries of God. It's on our job to think and believe we understand the mind of God. But God has told us to be people of faith and expectancy uh, that we step out, hands and feet of Jesus, do the things Jesus did, that the apostles did, that they were taught to do. All of it is based upon faith. And see, Jesus told Doubting Thomas, and I'll end on this point. You already know the story. He said, I won't believe it till I touch. This is a picture. Doubting Thomas probably went on to be the greatest apostle ever for all we know. We don't have we don't have much. But, you know, I don't doubt that he was a great apostle. Probably has a wonderful story. It's probably in some history book somewhere, even though it's not in the Bible. But the fact of the matter is he didn't believe Jesus was risen from the dead. He would not believe until he could touch the wounds. And Jesus appeared and he did exactly that. And he said to him, well, you see me, so you believe. But blessed are those who don't see me and still believe. That's by faith. Now, that was a bit of a rebuke from Jesus to Doubting Thomas. But it was also a good news message for the rest of us to read that and recognize that God does not expect us nor going to bless us if we say we don't believe in anything of God unless we firsthand witness it and we get a medical report to back it up and everything else is, you know, scientifically proven to be, you know, no, by faith we believe. And if that's true, we'll be blessed. You guess what? When we're blessed, one of the things is to experience more of the miracles in our life, more of the answered prayer in your life. You want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit and actually see things that are miraculous. If you're a person that's doubting, First thing you need to do, don't be doubting Thomas. Remove the doubt. Pray that God will help you remove the doubt. Step out in faith and believe and have an expectancy that God does miracles and watch the hand of God move in your life and you'll have all the miracles you ever need to know for a fact. Not only do you have the assurance of your salvation, that your salvation is well placed and your faith is well placed in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, and you won't worry about it ever again for the rest of your life because God spoke 
and spoke maybe spoke into your life with his miraculous hand manifesting in a way that only means something to you. I have so many stories about that in my life. There's no way for the rest of my life I'll ever deny Christ or ever think that, you know, maybe there's another uh, benefit to a different religion ever. Because God, so many times in my life, simply because I wasn't looking for it, I wasn't seeking it, but I was open and, ex- and have faith for it, God just revealed to me in many miraculous ways, you're on the right track. Your faith is well placed in my son, Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will work around you and with you and in your life. And I've just seen it pour out in miraculous ways. I want everyone to experience that. But faith is a key. And not being Doubting Thomas and being like, I will not believe until I have a proof. You're never going to get that proof. Doubting Thomas was unique. You're not Doubting Thomas. Jesus isn't going to show up and say, here, touch my wounds. I want you to believe so bad. He said, blessed are those who don't see and still believe. So there you go. There's my lesson for today. I hope it's beneficial to you. And with that, I'm off. So thanks for watching. And may the peace and love of Jesus Christ be with you now and forever. Amen. Bye-bye.